All right, good afternoon. I'd like to, uh, it's 1.56, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order and we'll begin um, with the roll call of commission members. Um, after I uh, call your name, um, please reply here or present and uh, confirm that you can uh, see or hear me. Commissioner Hughes. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Commissioner Ponce. I can see you and I can hear you. All right, and I believe that that is everyone uh, for today's meeting. Last year, Governor Pritzker signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that Chairman Wong of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks can determine that an in-person meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its permit review committee are not practical or prudent. I wanna make sure that our virtual meetings meet all the conditions of the Open Meeting Act as amended. Therefore, Chairman Wong has made a determination pursuant to section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting uh, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its Permit Review Committee is not practical or prudent. Similarly, he also determined pursuant to Section 7E5 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is infeasible for at least one member of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place for either meeting inasmuch as there is no physical meeting place. Pursuant to a resolution adopted by Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 4, 2020, regarding the Chairman's emergency rulemaking powers, Chairman Wong issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation, effective January 19, 2021. These rules were posted on the Commission's website. In line with these emergency rules, today's regular commission meeting is a, is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live stream. Commission meetings have been held virtually since May of last year. Meetings are structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meeting, and these have been posted on the commission's website and are available for public view during the virtual meeting at www.chicago.gov ccl. Members of the public desiring to speak today at today's meeting were required to register before the meeting and verbal statements by the public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. Applicants and their representatives, as, as well as aldermen, were asked to contact staff if they desire to speak, and they will be able to do so after the staff presentation on a specific project. Three members of the general public have, just, have signed up to speak on agenda item one, the project at 513 West Fulton. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes, but begin by saying your name and the association you represent, if any, for the record. May we please hear first from Max Chavez. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Sure can. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Max Chavez. I'm Director of Research and Special Projects at Preservation Chicago. Uh, I'm speaking today about the demolition and the proposed redevelopment of 513 West Fullerton, the Seneca Retreat and Conference Center. Uh, this collection of elegant modernist structures designed by architect Charles Pope uh, and completed in 1967 are defined by really dazzling brickwork and a powerful simplicity that speaks to peace and, and contemplation. Uh, and they may all soon become just a pile of rubble. The plan to decimate these buildings, which are beautiful in appearance uh, and dynamic for the contrast that they bring to the surrounding Mid-North District are regrettable. And they don't represent the creativity that I know we're capable of implementing here. The Seneca Retreat offers numerous opportunities to implement smart, adaptive reuse, while also achieving the goal of providing additional housing units as proposed by this redevelopment. The center's offices, lodgings, and spaces of worship are perfectly capable of conversion into housing, and its gardens, while lovely, can certainly be used for infill construction. If anything, retention and reuse of these structures could likely provide even more housing units than what's ultimately being proposed for this site. We've proven time and time again that we can remake anything into housing, offices, hotels, warehouses, churches. So why would we pass up this opportunity to continue to provide more for our communities? We continue to be hamstrung by narrowly defined frameworks for protecting our historic resources. 
reliance on the wildly outdated Chicago Historic Resources Survey and the demolitions that stem from that reliance prove time and time again that we're ill-equipped in 2021 to protect eight decades, nearly a century of Chicago's architectural and urban history. In the coming years, will we be content to look back at what was lost under our watch knowing that we could have done more? The impending destruction of the Seneca Retreat is one of these instances, the entirely preventable obliteration of irreplaceable design and craftsmanship that I'm sure we will surely come to regret. The landmark report for the Mid-North District, completed in 1974, just seven years after the construction of the Seneca Retreat, foresaw the crisis that we are facing today. It reads, guidelines should evolve through an understanding of the architecture and development of Mid-North. This kind of understanding will result in a flexible set of guidelines. Rigid rules will only stifle the vitality of Mid-North. Our cities evolve, and so must our guidelines, our policies, our mindsets, and our actions. So let's begin here with the Seneca Retreat Center and acknowledge that just because our frameworks deem something insignificant, we don't have to accept that as a fact. The redevelopment of the Seneca Retreat Center is an opportunity for us to do better. Uh, we strongly believe that the determination of historical insignificance be rejected and that alternative options that center adaptive reuse be given the time of day for discussion. So please, let's take advantage of this moment and find a creative reimagining that will honor the fabric of the site and show that we are capable of much more than resignation to rampant demolition. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Now can we please hear from Melissa Masik? Yes, I'm here, thank you so much. Um, my name is Melissa Masik. I am um, the Mid-North Association president and I am here to read a letter of support that um, we have, uh, that I will send a copy to um, Mr. Schur along with the alderman and a representative at Henry Street Partners. Um, dear committee members, uh, Mid-North Association is in support of the redevelopment of 513 West Fullerton, the cynical redevelopment. Uh, we're in support of this project due to Henry Street Partners willingness to negotiate a covenant that will ensure the development of this um, property is consistent with the historic properties that surround the site. The terms of the covenant are consistent with the site plan that has been proposed by Henry Street Partners LLC and the covenant reflects those terms and conditions. Um, we're also in support of this development due to the thoughtful and sensitive planning that Henry Street Partners has devoted to the project. We believe this project will benefit the neighborhood and is consistent with Mid-North Association's mission and goals. Um, we expect to have the, the covenant isn't signed yet, but we expect to have the covenant signed by both parties in the next couple of days and we'll send a copy to Landmarks once it has been signed um, for the record. If there's any further indication of support that is needed, we are happy to provide it. Again, uh, Melissa Masick on behalf of Mid-North Association. Thank you, Ms. Masick. Mm -hmm. Can we now hear from Patrick Steffes? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thanks so much. And um, thank you for your, for the ability to speak today. Yeah, I just briefly wanted to say a few things. I am, my name is Patrick Steffes. I'm the board secretary for Docomomo US Chicago, which is an organization which promotes um, the preservation, study, and research on the recent built environment, particularly from this era, um, from the mid-1960s. And I, I really can't add much to what Mr. Chavez said. He did such a great job of explaining the importance of this project. And I think more importantly, how it so cohesively fits into the neighborhood. It was, when this all came up for demolition, it was something that I wasn't even that familiar with. I live maybe a few miles north of there, but um, when I went down to the site and really examined it closely, I saw how incredibly well it blends into the neighborhood. It's such a great neighbor, it's so cohesive. And as Mr. Chavez says, the quality of the construction and the detailing is so remarkable. I, I think it would be very difficult um, to replicate something like that, um, just the cost that would be involved. And just, I think, you know, having not seen the plans for the redevelopment, I think that anything that would go in would probably be um, what's similarly being built in a lot of other areas in Lincoln Park and sort of Lakeview, those sort of single family standalone houses. Um, and again, I think it's important with what Mr. Chavez says, the fact that we have not had the ability to update our historic resources survey since 19, building built since 1939. I think something like this could be seen in the future as having very high aesthetic and historical value. And it is my hope that the building, the existing buildings can be repurposed without demolition. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Steffes. That's all the speakers uh, who signed up to speak for the permit review committee meeting. So we'll go, we can now begin the agenda. 
Uh, first uh, item is uh, the approval. Uh, the approval. Larry? Larry. I believe your I believe. mic is on. Uh, the first item is the approval of the minutes um, uh, from the regular meeting of September 2nd, um, 2021. Um, commissioners, as a reminder, when you speak, uh, make a motion, uh, second a motion, press the raise hand function on the panelist window, and I will call upon you. And I'd like to request a motion to approve the minutes for the September 2nd, 2021 meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Commissioner Ponce has seconded that motion. And uh, I also uh, um, agree with the motion. And so the motion carries unanimously and the minutes will be posted um, on the commission's website. That brings us to the first project on the agenda, which is 513 West Fortin, the Seneca Redevelopment in the 43rd Ward, Alderman Smith, Mid-North District. Um, this project is the proposed division of property into nine parcels for residential development, including parameters regarding future new construction and proposed construction of a new four-story, nine-unit residential building on a single par parcel. And I'd like to call on Larry Scher for the presentation. Okay, hopefully my uh, microphone won't be interfering with itself. Uh, at the June 3rd meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, the Seneca Covenant at 513 West Fullerton was found to be non-contributing to the Mid-North District and the demolition has since been approved by City Council. The applicant proposes to subdivide the property into nine parcels and has submitted drawings for the proposed new construction on lot nine. The remaining eight lots will be developed with single family or two flat buildings by future purchasers and the design of each of the new structures will be presented to the committee for review and approval at future meetings. To help guide these future new construction projects, the applicant has submitted a subdivision plan showing the size locations of the new parcels, two new curb cuts, overall parameters defining the parking and garage locations, front and side yard setbacks, and maximum building heights of the future new residential buildings. The applicant seeks the committee's conceptual approval of the overall plan and the above listed parameters to guide future infill proposals, as well as pre-permit approval of the new multifamily building proposed to be constructed on lot nine. Uh, this exhibit illustrates the proposed subdivision which staff recommends is compatible with a range of historic lot sizes found within the district. Lots one, two, and three have their frontage along Fullerton Parkway and are accessed by a private drive at the rear. They're proposed to accommodate a maximum of two dwelling units per lot. Lot four has frontage on Cleveland, but is accessed to the, through the same private drive and is proposed to have one dwelling unit. Uh, height uh, along Fullerton is limited to 47 feet. Lots four, five, and six have all their frontage along Cleveland Avenue are intended to be improved with single family homes. The front 20 feet of lots four, five, and six required an additional eight foot side yard setback, which would result in a building somewhat narrower at the front of the lot. This is consistent with some historic buildings in the district, which incorporate projecting bays set back from the front facade. The applicant proposes that lots five and six be accessed through a shared drive requiring a single curb cut on Cleveland Avenue. Heights of those lots are limited between 42 and 40 feet in height. Uh, garages are to be located in the rear yards of lots one through four. For lots five and six, garages may be located, uh, may not be located in the front yard, and no garage door may face Cleveland Avenue unless located in the rear yard. Lots seven and eight have frontage along the south portion of Cambridge. A shared drive is proposed between the two lots requiring a single curb cut on Cambridge. Any future garages may not be in the front yard and garage doors may not face Cambridge. The applicant proposes a maximum of two dwelling units on lot seven and eight, and height is limited to 36 feet. Lot nine is in the interior of the block and access through the north portion of Cambridge. The height of new construction on this lot is limited to no greater than 51.58 feet. The subject property is a bit atypical for the district and has always lacked a public alley. 
there are 14 curb cuts located on the block of Cleveland between Belden and Fullerton, which is the greatest concentration of curb cuts within the Mid-North District. As proposed, lots one, two, three, and four will be served by a new private drive at the rear, which is the preferred approach and compatible with historic development in the overall district. As I mentioned, there are two new curb cuts proposed on Cleveland and Cambridge. Each are intended to provide access to two lots and are located at the shared lot line between the two parcels. According to the applicant, it is not possible to locate new rear private drives to serve the lots on Cambridge and Cleveland due to development limitations. Specifically, the insertion of a north-south alley is not viable because of existing ComEd utility easements, which require certain clearances to function correctly. A required ComEd easement on the north property line of lot seven and eight make it impossible to extend an alley or private drive in that area. In addition, there is an existing ComEd easement located on the west property line of lot nine, which prevents access to lot seven and eight due to those required clearances. Because of these site limitations, staff supports the applicant's proposal to install two new curb cuts as proposed. Staff recommends that the proposed site plan with associated parameters will result in buildings which may be compatible with the historic character of the district regarding overall lot sizes, garage and parking locations, building setbacks, maximum building heights, and curb cut conditions, and recommends that the committee conceptually approve the proposed plan dated September 28, 2021. Staff further notes that the design of each new structure on lots one through eight remains subject to the typical infill design requirements of the permit review committee and shall be submitted for future review and approval by the committee when available. That's part one. Part two is a review of the new construction proposed for lot nine. As I mentioned, they're proposing to construct a new four-story, nine-unit residential building on lot nine within the proposed subdivision. The building will be accessed from the north portion of Cambridge and is approximately 107 feet in length and 69 feet in width. The proposed design incorporates a partially below grade parking area for approximately 20 cars, a roof deck and outdoor terrace areas. The building utilizes a glass and brick pedestal and masonry garden walls separate the property from its neighbors to the north and south. The applicant is proposing a very contemporary design utilizing vertically oriented windows arranged in a variety of configurations Historic buildings in the district also exhibit a varying window modules, often on the same floor. The use of metal screens over select windows further addresses the historic solid void relationships typical for the district. The upper floor is cantilever out over the first floor. Although this is not a typical historic condition in the district, it can be interpreted as a contemporary reference to historic projecting bays, which cantilever out over the first floor. A ramp leads down to the parking area while a portion of the first floor provides lobby space and shared amenities. The first floor unit has access to a raised terrace on the east, and a raised walkway on the south provides pedestrian access to the south portion of Cambridge. The new building utilizes masonry garden walls to more clearly define the private and semi-private spaces. It has a simplified projecting cornice and window hoods to add variety and depth to the facade. The commission does encourage contemporary design when the new construction is compatible with and complements existing historic and architectural features and qualities. And staff does recommend that the proposed new construction is compatible with the district. Uh, here are the uh, overall elevations, just to give you a better sense of the design of the building. Uh, the next slide addresses the uh, streetscape elevations, uh, which, uh, which are required for uh, review of infill development within the district. This is the uh, view from the north portion of Cambridge looking to the east. And the building on the left is a courtyard apartment building and to the right is the proposed new construction building. Uh, and you can see the, um, the overall height and fenestration of those in comparison. The next slide shows a color rendering of the building from that same angle, uh, just to give you a better sense of the overall cladding uh, and, uh, and character of that building. 
Next slide is the uh, streetscape elevation looking uh, south from Fullerton. Now you can see there's a gap here. This is actually where the three new lots are proposed to be located on Fullerton. So potentially when those lots develop, this will be minimally visible from vantage points on Fullerton. Uh, so what you're really looking at is you're really looking through the block. And again, you can see how this relates to the existing heights and, uh, and facades of those historic buildings along Fullerton. And the uh, next slide is a rendering from that same angle. So this is the, oh, did we miss one? Ooh, we're missing a slide. Uh, anyway, this is the view from Cleveland looking west. Um, and uh, again, you're looking through the three new lots proposed to have frontage along Cleveland. And you can see how the height and facade relates to that historic building on the right, uh, which kind of turns the corner of Cleveland and Fullerton. And the next slide is a, uh, a rendering from that same vantage point. Finally, we have a streetscape from the south portion of Cambridge, again, looking through those proposed two new lots, which have frontage along Cambridge at the new building. You can see a non-contributing, non-historic building uh, to the left. Uh, and then you can sort of see uh, the proposed new building through those two new lots. And we have uh, yet another rendering from that same vantage point on the uh, next slide. There we go. So the applicants are proposing a range of materials, including a gray wall panel, black aluminum window frames, dark gray brick cladding, and gray concrete pavers. The building utilizes a wood timber frame, so the exposed structural columns and soffits are shown as clear wood. Additionally, the applicant proposes a metal cladding pattern to resemble the color and stacked bond coursing found on historic gray stones within the district. And staff recommends that the proposed materials are compatible with the historic materials in the district. And the next slide actually gives you a little bit more detail uh, on how that facade will look and include some examples of a similar use of that material. Okay. So that brings us to our recommendations. Uh, we've got three of them. Uh, the first relates to the proposed site plan. Uh, we're recommending that the proposed plan dated September 28th, uh, showing the sizes and locations of the new parcels, locations of two new curb cuts, overall parameters defining the parking and garage locations, front and side yard setbacks, and maximum building heights for future residential buildings for lots one through eight is conceptually approved. And two, that the design of each new structure on lots one through eight shall be submitted for future review and approval by the Permit Review Committee when available. And third, that the proposed four-story non-unit multifamily building is approved as shown on drawings dated March 23rd, 2021, and that the mentioned window, door, curtain wall details shall be submitted with those permit plans. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I know that the applicants are also on the call. And I understand the alderman also wishes, wishes to uh, make a statement. But if you have questions for me about my presentation, I'd be glad to take those now. Thank you, Larry. Any questions from the commission? Seeing um, none. Um, let's let's hear from the applicant and the representatives. And then I know that the alder, alderman is here, so we'll hear from her after. Um, uh, maybe please hear from developer Robert Buono. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioner, members. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, in, uh, I'm the primarily going to add just the community process uh, that we have uh, engaged in over the last uh, approximately 12 months with the Alderman's Office, uh, the Mid North Association, and then. Uh, our proximate neighbors uh, to develop the, the details around this plan, uh, which as you can see are, are, are quite specific. Uh, I hope consider thoughtful uh, in addressing the, uh, the, the numerous uh, ideas uh, and concerns that were raised uh, around uh, the neighborhood and that uh, the opportunity to develop an unusually configured 
property like this one, uh, that the proposed configuration is actually quite similar uh, to its historic configuration, uh, going back as early as the 1870s in terms of how this property was originally subdivided and we are effectively returning to that. Um, I would emphasize that the center portion of the proposed building is very much in the center of the property, um, is virtually not on a public way. Uh, and, that, and that finally the opportunity, I think, to bring eight different uh, designs uh, in the future uh, to the lots as either single family uh, or two flats has been generally well received uh, to contribute to the interesting diversity of architecture that already uh, exists uh, in and around the property. So we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, our attorney, uh, our architectural team, uh, we're all present to the extent that that's helpful to you. All right, thank you, Ms. Buono. Um, any any questions for Mr. Buono at this time or shall we hear from the elder alderman first? Commissioners, seeing, seeing none, um, Alderman Smith is here. Um, can you please hear from her? Here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chairman. I'll just take a moment to say, I really want to thank the Landmark Committee staff for their thoughtful work in the review of this project. Um, as many of you know, I'm a fierce advocate for preservation in our community. And uh, when it became apparent that this um, building uh, was not uh, appropriately part of the district and would come down, our community wanted to make sure that the, that the new buildings that came in would be appropriate to the district. And so rather than take nine buildings over the next number of years and have a tussle over the size, setbacks, and overall verticality versus width, whatever, instead of having those fights, we asked the developer, would they be willing to be limited right from the outset. And they agreed. So we, with the landmark staff, negotiated with the developer to have protection for the community in two ways. Uh, one is a private covenant, and the other is this proposed ordinance. And we are so grateful that landmark staff and the law department work with us to try to ensure in the future that as these other lots are developed, that, they're, that the size of those buildings is consistent with the size and the shape of the other buildings in the district. That was a key part of this landmark designation. So this is a very um, thoughtful and a unique way to bring in a, a lot of new construction in one of our oldest landmark districts. And I ask for your support, for your support, and of course, be willing to answer any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Alderman Smith. Do uh, any commission members have questions for the alderman or the, the owner um, at this time? Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Can you talk about the community involvement in this process? Uh, I certainly can, if you'd like. Yes, we have an active, um, we have active community groups in our area, and the Mid North Association has been the protector of that landmark district since it was created. And we had uh, several meetings, and we even had we had several meetings, and there were negotiations going on for some time. Several uh, attorneys. Uh, who are part of Mid North, who are also uh, real estate attorneys, uh, pretty well known one, uh, pretty well known ones live on the block. And so they became involved in the drafting with uh, Rob Bono and his uh, team with the covenant to make sure that individual landowners had some protection. But at the same time, uh, I and the community, in a parallel way negotiated and worked with the landmark commission to see what things would work out. So uh, we even went to the site as a group with a tape measure to make sure that 
the that the size of these new buildings would be consistent with other buildings in the district. This is a particular thing that we have um, had issues with in the past, and we wanted to try to make sure that whatever was agreed to, that our neighborhood organization and the immediate neighbors, because it was more than just the organization, everyone on Cleveland was invited to participate. And Cleveland and, and um, Fullerton, and we spoke to the owners on Cambridge. So we really did have a lot of hands in this, a lot of responsible hands. Commissioner Hughes. Thank you. Um, and thank you for explaining a bit more about that process. That's really helpful. Um, the, the package that you guys submitted was extremely detailed, uh, which is much appreciated. And, you know, it is, I'm still wrapping my mind around this because it is a really awkward piece of land. Um, and, and, you know, all of the minutia that you guys had to go through to really make this work um, seems like it probably was a long and, and much needed process because it, it's just an awkward piece of land. There's no other way to say it. Um, but I, I guess I will just add, um, in addition to the scale considerations um, for the protection of the community and kind of keeping with uh, the feel of the historic district, hopefully there's gonna be some, some scrutiny and due diligence in the material selection, um, the overall feel of the new properties as they come online. Um, this one, the design as it is now, and I, I you know, I don't want to comment too much on the design, but just generally speaking, it does uh, delineate itself from its surroundings, which is okay, I feel like, because it's hidden a little bit. Um, and once the other properties come online, they will mask it even more. But hopefully there's a different consideration taken into account for the properties that will front the street. Thank you for that. I should have said that myself. <laughs> thank you. That's exactly how we feel about it. Sure thing. All right, thank you. Um, any, other, any other questions or should we move to discussion? There being none. Um, no, I, I would just I would make a comment. Um, no, I think it's, it's, it's shown, this shows some great work um, that really, uh, you know, putting a whole concept plan out there really helps in terms of like you, you, the curb cuts have been minimized, which I think is going to one of the not only is the size and the and the bulk of the buildings are always an issue, but um, you know the, the 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 ability to look at this plan now helps with you know really preserving the streetscape uh, for future development. So I really appreciate that. Um, and with the new building, it's a it's an atypical it's an atypical situation. It's 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 kind of in the center there. So. Um, I don't have too much, too much to say about that. Um, I do know it's a Wheeler Kearns, and uh, I, I we, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wheeler's on the call here, I think, but it's uh, an old professor of mine, so it's nice to see him. Always admiring his work. <laughs> um, any other questions from the commission? I do have just one more question. Yes, um, I'm just curious what your plans are for demolition and the preservation of those materials, the beautiful brick. I'll, I'll take that question, Rob Bono. Uh, so there are two components to the project uh, in its materials uh, that will be uh, more delicately removed. Uh, in the demolition process. Uh, one is some of the stained glass in the interior of the chapel, which actually is not even visible uh, from, from any aspect of the building. It's a bit unusual because it's behind opaque uh, or acrylic uh, windows, so it's not visible, but there are some aspects of that that we intend to, pres uh, to re remove initially and preserve. And then uh, the face brick, depending on how easily it comes apart uh, from the mortar, and frankly, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, our, our hope is that it breaks apart uh, cleanly, uh, or at least easily, uh, so that 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 the uh, face brick can be uh, can be salvaged. We don't intend to use it uh, primarily in the new projects. There may be a couple of opportunities to do so. Uh, but 
they will be to the extent possible uh, salvaged and then uh, our contractor will make them available to the various uh, folks that uh, sell brick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's a, I think that's just, a, I think that's a great point um, to see if there, I understand that the, the red brick might not work with, with the aesthetic, but that would be uh, a great consideration if there's, if there's places for it, but definitely the idea that you're, you're going to, you're going to uh, repurpose it in, in another project or uh, recycle it appropriately. is great. Um, any other, any other questions? Um, there being no further discussion, uh, I'd like to request a, a motion uh, to adopt the staff recommendation for the project. Do we have a motion? That's so moved. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> and I am uh, yes as well. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Seconds. Um, and uh, the motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for the good effort. We look forward to seeing much. the projects come forward in the future. Yeah. Okay. All Thanks. right. Thank you All very right. much. Thank you. All right. We'll move to item number two, uh, project number two, 1367 North Milwaukee, Milwaukee Avenue District, uh, the proposed new operable rooftop enclosure with parapet alterations. Emily Barton, um, please um, provide the presentation. Definitely. Thank you, Commissioner. So this subject property is located mid-block uh, on Milwaukee Avenue between Wood and Polina. The building is a new construction project that was approved by the Permit Review Committee in 2013 and um, built soon after. So the existing building is currently one story tall with a roof deck and second story set back approximately 50 feet, which you can see highlighted in orange on the site plan. The applicant is proposing to add a new glass and metal operable enclosure to the roof deck so as to be able to use the space year round. The proposed new structure is approximately 50 feet deep and gable shaped with the ridge height approximately 31 feet 5 inches above grade. To minimize visibility, the 36 foot wide enclosure is proposed to be set back 10 foot two inches from the front facade outer parapet and approximately six feet from the outer side parapets. A fixed standing seam roof will connect the structure to the parapets. So at its highest point, the enclosure will be 10 foot six inches above the existing parapet and at its lowest point, approximately six feet above the existing parapet. The applicant is proposing to raise the height of the parapet on the front elevation of the building, uh, approximately four foot seven inches with the top two feet um, inset three foot eight inches to add some visual interest. The new parapet will be capped with limestone and will further minimize visibility of the new enclosure from Milwaukee Avenue. The applicant included a streetscape analysis in their submission to illustrate that the new parapet height will be compatible with existing historic building proportions on adjacent buildings. The side parapets are currently framed plywood. The applicant proposes to replace this with a cast stone masonry to match that on the front facade parapet. Uh, okay. So as a new construction, non-contributing building to the district, there are not any significant features that will be obscured by the new enclosure addition or parapet modifications. The new overall height is proportional to historic buildings within the district and the setback of the structure allows for it to read as a secondary rooftop addition rather than a glass gable roofed building. Because of these reasons, staff recommends approval of the enclosure and parapet modifications as shown on drawings dated um, 9-2021. Staff further recommends that all new masonry shall match the existing on the building and that masonry samples shall be submitted to staff with the permit application. Included in your packets was a letter of opposition from the Wicker Park Committee stating that in their opinion, the visibility of the greenhouse structure is inconsistent with the streetscape and detrimental to the character of the district. 
Um, I'm here if you have any questions and I believe um, the project designer is here as well. Perfect, thank you, Emily. Any questions for Emily at this time? Um, sure, let's, uh, let's hear from, from the applicant. Um, can we please hear from uh, project representative Jeff Pavlatos? Yeah, how you doing? Uh, I'm Jeff cool. Pavlatos. I have uh, Luis Vasquez here from our office Hi, as well. how are you guys? So, um, yeah, I think Emily did a great job there, uh, kind of getting the points across. We kind of went back and forth, obviously, with, with staff to get to this point, and uh, we feel we've got a great solution here in, in keeping with the, uh, you know, the historic district there, and you know, getting, getting the client what they need with uh, a little bit more versatile rooftop uh, usage. Uh, this doesn't really change anything with their uh, operations. The rooftop is still going to remain a rooftop. Uh, this just gives them the ability to adapt a little bit to weather both all year round and then just inclement weather in the summertime. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the outdoor spaces are becoming more uh, relevant since COVID and you know, just they're becoming just valuable and, and whatever we can do to make them, you know, uh, more versatile is, is kind of the goal here. Thank you, Mr. Pavlatos. Um, any commission members uh, questions for, for the applicant about the project? Yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, with there being an opposition letter from the community, um, can you explain the process uh, please, did you guys have a community, um, any open forums or engagement with the community to understand their perspective throughout your design process? Uh, we did. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, some, of the, some of the community members there maybe have some opposition because of the operation itself. Um, and, and, and that was kind of reflected in their um, discussions about but the project. So I, I think that their issues were more with noise and, you know, th they're operating a bar and it's a rooftop deck. I think that was a lot of their issues that, that had come up. Again, we're trying to minimize that by adding this rooftop enclosure. So I know that, you know, anytime you have outdoor space and there's music and there's things going on, anything we can do to minimize that with a retractable roof is going to keep that sound in. And I think overall benefit the neighbors um, to try and hopefully ease some of their issues they may be having with, with the with the operations of the facility. They had concerns with, um, I guess, extending the longevity of like their usage. So I think it was kind of slightly personal, I think, in my opinion. Um, I think they were um, worried about them extending into the three seasons versus, you know, just the warmer months. But I, I think it's like, um, whiskey business, they've been operating on their rooftop all year, all year round. Right. Yeah. So I don't really see how that could be um, a problem for them, but, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, we suggested maybe, you know, um, some integration between the, the management there at whiskey business and the community to see how they can, you know, maybe work better together for the long haul here. Um, but overall, I, I don't know that the concerns were relative to our, our really our project. Uh, it was more, I think, uh, maybe a leverage to to get whiskey business to uh, be a little bit more considerate about the the noise. Thank you. I I, I think um, my response to that is um, they they mentioned the aesthetics of it not uh, being um, competitive um, compatible. Sorry, with the. Um, district that's there and with the the aesthetic that's there did you guys explore any other um kind of aesthetic components for that enclosure to see see what other options um would be available uh you know we, we kind of have a mix of of product going on um you know anything with we're the dealer for uh one of the biggest retractable uh, component systems for, for the Midwest area. So we're, we're very versed, you know, we don't, we always, look, we do design and we do the build. So we're very versed in how these things work and, you know, polycarbonate glass and aluminum is the only option when you're looking at a retractable scenario in, in a large scale roof like this. So, um, you know, I, I think that we tried to come up with the best combination of things to be fitting with the, the historic district. Um, I don't know that there's another alternative when it comes to the actual retractable roofing system though. 
Thank you. I just wanted to kind of piggyback on that one. Um, there is a, there, what I was the Wicker Park um, comment like about the visibility of the roof, right? And, you know, there is a parapet being added, right, to the, to the existing building. And I'm wondering if there's a way, you know, there's a, in these one story buildings, a lot of times you see some decorative element in the masonry. And I'm wondering if, if that has been considered at all. And I don't know if that's a question for Emily or for, um, for you. Yeah, I think maybe both, you know, we did have a, a version where we did raise the parapet up uh, considerably more to hide the system in its entirety. Um, and maybe Emily, you want to speak to that a little bit about. Um, yeah, I also say that, you know, looking for the com uh, fellow commissioners to, you know, for their opinions as well on that. Yeah, so um, like Jeff said, you know, the initial proposal after we gave them some comments, um, they had suggested raising up the parapet even higher um, and it helped to minimize the visibility of the structure, but we felt that it was not necessarily proportional with the other buildings, especially one story buildings um, in the district. But I think, um, I think that their streetscape does a really good job of illustrating that it's, yeah. it's really within, it's, it's within the context for sure, height wise. And there's a building across the street that has and a I, similar kind of- I wasn't like uh, suggesting raising the, I see this helps a lot, yeah. Yeah. Right. Any, any questions, uh, follow-up questions, commissioners? No, Commissioner Jakovic, I mean, I, you asked about comments and I, I don't oppose what, what they have presented. So I think it's a fine solution. Um, and what Emily says reinforces that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, um, our discussion from the commission, um, do we have a motion uh, to accept the, the staff recommendation? So moved. Commissioner Ponce, thank you. We have a second. We don't. <laughs> Um, I would, uh, for Commissioner, uh, I guess do I have to take a roll call now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Commissioner, Commissioner Hughes. I, I'm present on this one, sorry. And I, for the record, would be uh, yes, but I believe we need to have a solution today. So what do you have a, a revised motion that you would propose maybe to? No, if they still have majority vote, it passes, right? We need, we need all three. Oh God. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't want to, this it's fine. Whatever. Yes. I, I second the motion. Okay, um, we have a second, um, and I am again a yes for this, and so uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Um, we're going to go to item number three now, um, which is uh, the property at fourteen oh seven North Hoyne in the first ward, Alderman La Spada. Um, the proposed construction of new two-story additions above the existing one-story north garage, construction of a new one-story glass addition to connect the main house to the historic coach house, and construction of partially below grade accessory pool structures in the south and rear yards. And would like to call on Larry Shore for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is the three-story John H. Rapp house coach house uh, constructed in 1879 in the second empire style with Italian details. John Rapp was an early resident of the neighborhood and a prominent liquor merchant. In 2008, the permit review committee approved an exterior restoration and expansion of the property, including replacement of a non-historic garage, a new three-story staircase enclosure, and a rear addition. In 2014, the commission recognized this project 
with the Preservation Award. So the rear coach house had previously been separated from the main house and used as a separate residence. Uh, the current owner has purchased both the main house and coach house and intends to combine the property. Proposed new work includes additions on the north elevation, a one-story east addition between the main house and coach house, and a partially below grade pool in the south yard. The applicant proposes to add 4,000 square feet to their 10,000 square foot property. As proposed, this needs approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals due to encroachments into some required setbacks. Uh, as I mentioned, the coach house was separate from the main home for a number of years and uh, I believe was used as uh, rental units. Uh, a raised wood deck was constructed on the west for access to the second floor unit and a wood trellis extends into the south yard. The applicant proposes to remove these elements. The primary elevations of the coach house are the west and south elevations, which use red face brick and limestone sills and lintels. Changes to the size and location of windows and doors occurred over time, and the remaining lintel sills and infill indicate where those alterations were made. The applicant intends to restore the historic windows and doors on the east and west elevation. Various changes are proposed for the east or the alley elevation of the coach house, including the insertion of a new garage door and man door. Because this is considered a secondary elevation, staff recommends approval of these modifications and insertions as proposed. The applicant proposes to construct a one-story connector addition between the main house and the former coach house. This addition, which incorporates a glass curtain wall on the south elevation, is proposed to be set back eight feet from the south facade of the coach house. The addition is approximately 22 feet in width and 37 feet in depth. To minimize the height of the addition, the applicant proposes to depress the addition approximately three feet below grade. The addition connects to the previously approved rear addition on the main house and has a structural solution to connect the load-bearing west wall of the coach house without damaging or obscuring historic ornamental features. A roof deck with glass safety railings is proposed to be located on top of this feature. A glass and metal extension labeled as kitchen conservatory is proposed to be inserted into the east wall of the previously approved brick addition. The applicant has provided a rendering of the sunken patio in front of the one-story connector to illustrate how this element would appear from the south. As proposed, this area is located between the historic structures rather than immediately adjacent to the historic structures. Staff recommends that the setback and location of the below-grade terrace will be minimally visible and will not adversely affect the property or the district. Previously, the committee has approved of connections between main houses and coach houses, provided such connectors are clearly differentiated from the historic structures and do not damage or obscure the historic buildings. Based on its location, materials, and height, staff recommends approval of the proposed addition, provided that the permit plans include engineering reports and details to address how the proposed attachments to the coach house are to be safely accomplished. The applicant proposes to construct a partially below grade pool with associated support spaces at the corner of Schiller and Hoyne. The pool structure is located 20 feet 6 inches from the west property line and 14 feet 9 inches from the south property line. It is 100 feet in length and 19 feet in width. Access to the pool is through an underground hall from the one story addition. The pool structure is proposed to be covered with a glass enclosure screen by a 6 inch curb. Staff recommends that the new pool structure as proposed will be minimally visible and not an adverse effect on the property. In 2008, the committee approved a new one-story garage addition on the north elevation to replace a garage constructed without approval in 2000. The new garage, well, you can see the previous garage in the upper left photo. Uh, the new garage was lower in height, clad in common brick, with a greater setback from the front facade. A three-story masonry stair enclosure with a substantial setback was approved on the north elevation, and that was approved based on that design similarity to historic projecting bays found within the district, and it's clearly a secondary massing. 
the enclosure was no larger than required to provide code compliant stair access. The committee in 2008 agreed that these additions maintain the significant site characteristics of the property and the district. The current owner of the property is proposing to construct new additions on the north elevation located atop the existing garage on both sides of the existing stair enclosure. The new two-story addition on the northwest corner of the building aligns with the west and north sides of the one-story garage below, resulting in a three-story overall height with a seven-foot setback from the front facade. The addition terminates below the corporal brick cornice on the north elevation. Another two-story addition is proposed to be constructed east of the stair enclosure. Both additions are proposed to extend three foot six inches further into the north yard than the previously approved stair addition, resulting in an inset appearance of the stair enclosure as shown in these renderings. Commission policy has been to encourage additions at the rear of a property which match the width and height of the existing buildings. In rare cases where visible side additions are deemed appropriate, they are typically set back from the front facade and are substantially below the historic height of the building. Commission guidelines state that additions will be allowed only if they do not alter, change, obscure, damage, or destroy any significant features of the landmark or district. A particular concern are the effects of an addition on a building's historic relationship to its site, on a building's size, shape, and roof line, and on individual design details, elements, or materials which constitute all or part of the building's significant features. Based on this criteria, staff feels that the proposed additions on the north elevation are not compatible with the historic character of the property. This graphic most clearly illustrates the proposed mass of the addition and its substantial impact on the historic character with the primary facade of the house. While it is acceptable for additions to historic buildings to be differentiated, those additions must also be subservient to the original character of the property. Staff is concerned that the north addition closest to Hoyne, which is west of the existing stair enclosure, competes with the historic front facade in size and massing and obscures views to historic ornamental features, including the brick cornice and the dormers on the north slope of the mansard roof. This addition will be highly visible from vantage points immediately at the front of the property and to the north due to the substantial setbacks of the neighboring structures. As such, staff recommends that the additions would have an adverse effect on the historic scale and massing of the home and recommends that the addition west of the stair enclosure, labeled here as five, be eliminated entirely from the proposal. Staff recommends that the north addition east of the stair enclosure, labeled here as three, be reduced in depth to align with the north elevation of the existing stair enclosure. This would allow the stair enclosure to somewhat screen the addition and read as a single projecting extension. This approach has been approved for other rear additions which have aligned with and extended projecting bays. In general, staff recommends that new additions be located to the rear as much as possible, provided they do not damage or obscure the historic coach house. Uh, these are our two recommendations. Basically, number one is uh, just what I stated on the previous slide. And number two notes that the project as proposed would require zoning variations and or adjustments and recommends that the commission takes no position regarding any requested variance or adjustment relative to the zoning code requirements. That completes my presentation. Uh, I know the design team is here and the owner is here, and I believe their attorneys are also on the call. Uh, however, if you have questions for me about my presentation, I'd be glad to take those now. Thank you, Larry. Before we uh, hear from the applicant, any questions for, for Larry? All right, seeing none. Um, now we'd like to hear from the applicant um, or anyone in the applicant's party. Um, can we hear from the project architect, um, Andy Tanucci? I think, my understanding is you have a presentation. If you don't mind, um, I'd like to interject um, before Andy takes over. My okay. name is Mariah Degrino from the law firm of DLA Piper. Uh, I and my colleague Paul Shadel are here today representing the property owner. Um, I am joined by Andy Tanucci and Brian Foote of Woodhouse Tanucci Architects, the project architect. 
as well as Don Wilson and Naira Murphy, the homeowners. Uh, Mr. Wilson, through his ownership of real estate firm Convexity Properties, has a long history of completing award-winning historic restorations and rehabilitations in Chicago, including the Roby Hotel and the former Knoll State Bank building, the Three Arts Club, which became a flagship restoration hardware store, and the restoration of the old Cedar Hotel, uh, now the Viceroy Hotel. These projects demonstrate that Don has been a steward of historically significant and landmark structures in Chicago. Uh, Mr. Wilson and his wife have now acquired the properties, um, property at 1407 North Point and the adjacent coach house at 2044 West Schiller. Uh, the properties were originally one single property, a single family home with a coach house. They were subsequently divided to separate the primary house and the coach house. Um, the work uh, proposed today would restore the historic lot configuration and renovate the buildings to restore their use as a single family residence. Mr. Wilson and his wife intend to occupy the home uh, as, their, as their family home uh, and are seeking approval of modifications to the home that would uh, provide the additional square footage necessary to accommodate their large family. We do appreciate staff's considerations and the architects have evaluated many different possible approaches here to address the program space needs and specifically the North Facade Edition. Uh, as you'll hear Andy uh, articulate. Um, however, a critical objective for the project is to provide space needed to accommodate the owner's large family. Um, even with the additional square footage, the property would remain well under the maximum FAR permitted for a lot of the size. The architects have been able to confine most of the new program space to below grade areas and the glass connector with the remaining new square footage placed in an addition to the North facade. The north facade exists along an interior lot line and is possibly the least significant of any of the property's elevations. The architects have taken staff's comments into account in locating and designing the additions and modifications, and the plans presented today reflect changes made based on those comments. Um, at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Andy Tanucci at Woodhouse Tanucci Architects to further describe the project. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you uh, for having us. Um, Larry, you have our presentation, correct? You know, my, uh, my colleague will present this. Uh, just ask them to advance uh, as you uh, require. Okay, very good. Um, if you could just jump to the next slide, please. Um, first of all, uh, Larry, thank you very much uh, for your introduction and Maria, uh, the same appreciate uh, all the uh, effort that has gone into this project thus far. We appreciate uh, working with you on this. We've had several back and forth with uh, City Landmarks staff, and we just want to be clear that uh, we've, we've gone through many iterations. We have uh, studied many different options, which we will show you. We've taken staff comments uh, and refined the design proposal uh, on multiple times. And really uh, where we're, we're coming down to is this addition on the north facade. And we just want to be clear that we are seeking the PRC's approval of our uh, proposal as, as it stands, as we'll present to you um, today. So if you could forward. Uh, Maria introduced uh, our client, Don Wilson, and his company, Convexity. I'd like to also, if you could go to the next slide, uh, mention that uh, Woodhouse Tanucci has a uh, distinguished reputation in the city of Chicago uh, for working on uh, landmark and significantly uh, historic buildings, uh, the Buckingham Fountain Pavilions uh, in Grant Park as long as, as 20 years ago, and now as recently as uh, a project that we've been working on for a while, the, the Congress Theater. We've been in front of this committee multiple times and have a great track record of, of working with, collaborating with, and ultimately finding uh, excellent solutions uh, that respect the historic character of these projects that, that uh, we truly believe make Chicago what it is. Uh, next slide, please. So again, as the project's been introduced, uh, we have this uh, significant uh, piece of architecture on Beer Baron Row in Wicker Park. Next slide. The north facade being the, the key element of conversation. Um, we were surprised when we first walked around the north side of the building to see this stair tower addition. 
uh, frankly, it was not clear to us that it was uh, an addition as part of the tremendous 2009 renovation. Uh, it did appear to be historic as it went up to and intersected, joining the, uh, the eave of the roof line, maintaining that cornice around the perimeter. If you look to the picture on the top left, and this is where we ultimately uh, were able to make progress in our multiple meetings with the Wicker Park Committee, it should be noted that from the facade that existed prior to 2009, only three windows exist from that historic facade. Even all of the brick has been entirely replaced with new uh, Chicago Common face brick. Next slide, please. Also of note is that in 1970s, in the 1970s, the coach house was separated from the property. It became a separate pin. And while in 2009, there was this tremendous renovation to the wrap house, uh, bringing it back to this incredible character, the coach house has remained a separate property and, and remains uh, uh, kind of a hodgepodge of renovations uh, and, and alterations over the year. Our project aims to fully restore it back to the glory of the 2009 renovation to the wrap house. Additionally, by combining these two properties, removing the fence in between, removing the deck in between, uh, and two, one of the key criteria of the Secretary of Interior Standards, we're going to bring the entire property back to its historic use. A single family house with a coach house joined together through this connector in perpetuity so that we won't see in the future the changes that the project has gone through over the last hundred years. So if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, from these images, all the alterations. There is a lot of evidence on the building of where historic windows were and we will bring those windows back as part of our proposal. Next slide. Additionally, on the interior facade, the facade facing the main house, you can see once where the, the carriage may have been pulled in on the far left, you can see where the openings were. All of these openings will be brought back in the renovation, the deck removed. You can see the historic dormers have been significantly altered. We will bring those back as part of this project. So again, truly as part of this project, the goal is to restore the entire property to its original use and bring the coach house back to uh, as glorious a historic structure in Wicker Park as part of that corner view of Schiller and Hoyne uh, that it once was. Next slide, please. As Maria mentioned, uh, our client, uh, Don and his partner, Nairo, have a very large family. There's six children uh, that we need to provide homes for, uh, provide uh, bedrooms for. Additionally, uh, we would like to add some home offices uh, to the property. And with only one uh, garage currently on the premises, we'd like to add a couple additional uh, parking spaces. The pool that has been discussed is fully submerged in the front yard. Again, uh, allowing the property to remain, uh, that, that property to remain unbuilt in perpetuity, leaving that view to the neighborhood. So that 2000 square feet of addition is really not part of the conversation. And the only part of the conversation is, is the 1200 square feet of north addition, addition to the north facade, while that 800 or so square feet, 900 or so square feet of connector, we've worked with landmarks and refined uh, to, to a uh, suitable and uh, acceptable uh, design. Uh, next slide. So the property currently is obviously quite large at 10,000 square feet, but bringing the properties back together with the allowable FAR that the city of Chicago and the zoning allows brings the allowable floor area that could be built on the property to 18,000 square feet. We're not talking about 18,000 square feet. We're really only talking about 4,000 square feet. If you could go to the next slide. This is what 4,000 square feet looks like. And in 2,000 square of those square feet, we're putting below grade in the form of the pool in the front yard will not be visible from the corner as the landscaping will completely obscure that addition. Next slide, please. So we have uh, over the last several months and uh, in, in concert with Landmarks looked uh, at almost every possible solution that we can for where to place uh, these additional just couple thousand square feet of space, nothing close to what the FAR uh, allows. And you can see here in this series, those iterations. So in the top left, you can see the pool extending out from that gap. And that clearly from the primary views of the house 
uh, really distract from what was that historic reading of the historic house and coach house. In the second view, uh, you can see we look at taking some of the square footage and adding it on top of the coach house, but that uh, obviously conflicts with the standards in that it changes the roof line. Number three, and to uh, one of the points that, that Larry had made, additions are often preferred behind. Well, in this instance, that space between the two buildings is really not the back of the building. If that square footage was placed in between those two things, it would significantly obscure the reading of those two. It would change the roof lines of the overall joining the two significant structures potentially into, the, into reading as one. You can see the several other iterations uh, that we could talk about and are happy to talk about but we ultimately land on the lower right hand corner if you can go to the next slide whereby we sink the pool in the front of the property that's number four we have a connector between the two properties stepped back from the facade and sunken halfway below grade it's the lower level it's not even the primary story of the house so it's, it's almost invisible from the corner and then this 1200 square feet of, of addition uh, to the north that uh, sits atop the garage, the previously approved garage, and in part actually uh, contributes by concealing that previous uh, addition, uh, which we think reads as uh, being inappropriate in that it reads as being historic as opposed to new. So if you could go to the next slide. Again, here's uh, slightly better rendered views on the left, the current configuration of the house from the uh, southeast looking northwest. You can see the two structures. You can see a fence and a trellis that will be removed. And then our proposed renovations with the sunken pool, the, 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 the connector that is stepped down and stepped back with the additions in the north. Uh, next slide, please. And then again, the, the two additions on the north. So the points again to make on these additions to the north, they step back from the facade a full seven feet as the previous garage was planned to do. Um, they conceal that original, uh, that, that not original, excuse me, that 2009 stair tower that mimics uh, a, histor a historical structure while clearly being a new structure that was added in 2009. Uh, I'll also just say uh, that we have been in conversations with the neighbor to the north and that uh, neighbor has written a letter of support, which was part of the packet. The neighbor to the north actually quite prefers this addition because it is a more handsome uh, elevation uh, than what currently exists on the building. Um, okay, if we can uh, go to the next slide. We just wanted to then show you some views here is that canonical view of the property from Schiller and Hoyne looking northeast. Really, you can't stand there today uh, and see this same view because of all the leaves and the vegetation that's there. But we understand that this conversation uh, is void of vegetation because vegetation changes over time. Though clearly in a historic district, certainly a historic neighborhood like this, having been up and down the street, the landscape plays a huge role in all of these properties. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Here's just a similar view of the property as it exists now with vegetation removed, which again is how we present these things, uh, not at all how it, how it looks uh, currently or, or will continue to look in the future. You can see how that those two properties are obscured with the fence and the trellis and our proposed renovation. Next slide, please. Remove that fence and trellis. The connector, as you can see, is stepped back, so almost entirely invisible allowing the two structures to be very legible in their historic context. And that North addition from this vantage point is not visible. Next slide. Now here is probably the facade where we spend the most time talking. And this is a view looking across the neighbor to the North property at the North facade of the building. This is the facade of the building that we would say is actually the rear of the building. You, the face brick changes on this facade. It was clearly designed as though another structure would go there 100 years ago uh, by not carrying the face brick around. It has that 2009 addition, which, which uh, carries the, the corbeling and the cornice around and across, leaving only one window, one historic window, 
visible that had been there prior to that 2009 edition. And that's the one on the second story directly to the right of the stair tower. You can imagine this one view that we've taken. It's one of the only places where you can actually see this, uh, this actual view of the, of the house or the uh, Western facade of the house because of all the vegetation. So we remove the vegetation. Next slide, please. We remove the vegetation so that we can have this conversation and show you the exact same house as it stands currently with that 2009 addition. And then directly on top of that garage and obscuring that stair tower without increasing the footprint of the building at all. Next slide, please. With Chicago Common, so a harmonious material that blends in and steps back to the foreground, detailed in a, in a, in a uh, slightly different way so that it's very clearly distinguished as being a new structure versus this historic one with windows that are proportional to the existing structure's windows, we propose this 1,200 square feet of additional square footage on the house. In this location, not stepping it back, we don't risk any kind of additional structure, structural issues with the existing building undermining foundations in any way by building on top of that existing and approved uh, structure. Next slide. And again, to some of the uh, previously mentioned points, the addition steps down below the corbeling allowing, uh, and the cornice, allowing it to slide over the top of. Uh, the windows are proportional. Some of the historic banding is maintained across carrying those horizontal lines, stepped back clearly from the facade and in pure elevation, if, if you know, we don't need to go back to the presentation, but purely in elevation, only slightly wider than the stair tower and only just as wide as the previously approved garage. Uh, next slide, which I think is uh, about my last. Uh, lastly, and this is also to one of the Secretary of Interior standards, that existing facade on the north is being preserved on the interior of the building. So we're using the openings that exist currently in that facade for the openings into the addition. I know that we're primarily talking about the exterior of these buildings, but as architects, we're not only taxed with finding the most appropriate exterior solution, but also making the building work on the interior as well and leaving it as it generally was historically or currently. And so to speak, this is to say that if that addition was removed, those openings would still be there. You'd pass through them as openings into the rooms. And by placing these additions on the north, as opposed to say around the west, you would have, uh, you allow the building to operate, continue to operate in plan as it currently does, where the circulation path, as you can imagine from the front door, which is seen in the front foreground right, is allowed to be a hallway all the way through that you then enter into these additions uh, just to the north. We wouldn't have to cut open the building any further at the back of the building, making the historic rear of the building dark as opposed to light as it once was. And then I guess I think, um, can you go to the last one? I think, uh, I think lastly, maybe you could go back one. Thank you. If we were to remove this front addition fully and only uh, use the addition in the back, pushed in line with that stair tower that we feel isn't an appropriate addition to the building detailed in an appropriate way. Regardless, if we were to push the addition back to be in line with that, it would be eight feet wide. It would be eight feet wide by about 15 to 20 feet long, making for a 150 square foot room, which is really not an effective space. We can by zoning code and FAR build so much more square footage than we're attempting to build. We've looked long and hard. We've looked at every possible option we can to try and find and balance the most appropriate solution for this property. And if that's the space that we're given, uh, those additional 300, 150 square feet on each floor, we have unusable space, an eight foot wide closet, not a home office, an eight foot wide pantry, not a bedroom. It's really just not workable uh, to try and uh, make the space uh, lovely for this, this family moving in, restoring the property to its full glory and original use and doing everything possible to allow it to remain that way in perpetuity. Um, 
So with that, I think I will uh, let you go to the, you can go two slides ahead if you would, and just say thank you uh, again so much for your time. Uh, thanks to the Landmark staff for the continuous back and forth. We know this is a difficult one. Uh, thanks to, um, to the neighbors and thanks to the Wicker Park Committee for their time and back and forth as we've been able to get it um, uh, this far. And hopefully uh, we would ask for your approval today uh, so that we could move forward and um, get, get these folks into this lovely house. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Tanucci. Um, do any uh, commission members have questions? Um, you know, for the applicant. No, no questions. Um, any, uh, any, any point of, of discussion? Yeah, can, can we get some clarity on how the addition is um, interacting with the coach house um, on the west side? The, the coach house is to the east of the main house. Yes. And the addition on the north of the property does not connect to the coach house. There is a, a one-story connector that is that connects uh, to the west of the coach house, right? That's right. It connects from the west of the coach house uh, to the uh, east facade of the main house. Uh, it is at the lower level of the main house, which is several feet below grade. Here's a uh, an image of it, and steps back from the facade eight feet to fully expose those corners. It stays mm -hmm. down uh, below the eaves of the roof of the coach house. Uh, leaving that facade uh, intact. We've detailed, as you can see uh, on the lower right, uh, a kind of cool skylight clear story that comes up and attaches to the coach house right along that even cornice so that that full facade of the historic coach house is visible uh, from down below as we restore it. So as not to get into or intersect any of the key significant architectural features such as the windows or the lintels that you can see through that clear story in the lower right image. Does that answer your question? It does. And are those stairs to the north on top uh, of the? Yeah, that's correct. So this, the roof of the connector, <clears throat> the roof of the connector is a uh, porch that comes out from the kitchen of the main house, aligned with the primary floor, first floor of the main historic house. And there is a, a doorway and that doorway exists in, an exi in a dormer currently. We could look at that picture of the existing coach house and uh, provides access from that patio up to the second floor of the coach house, which is where two of the additional bedrooms are being located. Mm, okay. We have an image of that. That door exists you know, currently in that location uh, as one of the doorways into the apartment that's currently there. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you for that presentation. Um, I think your approach and the design to this whole uh, addition and project is, is, is beautiful, um, especially your explanation of the coach house and how you're bringing it back to its original state. Um, and I understand that eight feet does not get you does not get you much of workable functional living space too. Um, so you are proposing to add on that elevation where the common brick is not part of the landmark, um, which I understand as well. That approach, um, my I, I just have you know one comment really that it's not on your design or anything like that, but, you know, adding, adding square footage, um, I will probably sound like I'm beating a dead horse and in the optimization of building performance, um, when you're adding such um, an amount of a square footage, what, 
maybe you have thought about this in the in the design approach and the solution of, of adding square footage. Um, I just think that you know landmarks um, maybe is falling you know a bit behind on on the preservation and optimization of our buildings. I'm just curious what you think on that and what your approach is. Um. Well, I, I want to make sure I understand you correctly. So let me try and answer, and if that doesn't fully answer. So um, mm -hmm. clearly with the addition, anytime we get to work on an, an, an historic building, we feel like we're improving that building over the long term. Uh, we, we all live in Chicago. Most of us probably have in some way or another, not historically significant, but a historic homes. Our homes are you know old. And anytime we add on to them or renovate them, we're improving their performance. We're adding uh, insulation to those things uh, we're increasing, you know, we're using mechanical systems that are, that are more efficient. So I think uh, in this way, we're able with this addition to continue to uh, preserve these buildings, uh, not just their aesthetics, but uh, their construction technology by, by improving how they, how they perform. So they, they perform better uh, from a building technology standpoint, they perform better from an energy standpoint. Um, you don't necessarily know this about our firm, uh, but we are, uh, you know, huge believers in being great stewards of the environment uh, and sustainability. Many of our projects uh, are highly regarded. We recently run what's called a COAT Award, a Council on the Environment Award for having one of the 10 most environmentally sustainable projects done at the University of Chicago. Uh, Convexity, too, highly believes in this, and they are uh, a carbon neutral company. Um, they, their, their projects are always trying to optimize building performance and the, the building has a, a geothermal mechanical system and we are exploring the use of solar panels to uh, allow the project to be more sustainable and higher performing. And gosh, I hope that's starting to answer your question. <laughs> Yes, it does. And I am familiar with the University of Chicago project. I was a sustainability director for that, uh, pre uh, consultant for that project as well. So I'm very familiar with that project um, and, and, and your work. And that, my question was specific to this project. But thank, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Um, any, any, anything else? Yeah, I, I love Commissioner Ponce's points today uh, about sustainability. And I think uh, it's probably a note for us um, to maybe just start having that a part of people's regular presentations as they come before us, um, speaking to the sustainability of each project because we do we do care about it for every single property. Um, and, and it does start with you know, the existing building um, being a more sustainable approach than digging in the ground. But, but we have to go 50 steps further than that, right? We can't just depend on the fact that we are, um, you know, an, approaching an existing building. I want to know, um, Andy, a little bit more about the pool. Uh, why is the pool separated into two? Why isn't it combined into one pool um, on oh, the property? A, sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Okay, so the pool is uh, fully submerged below ground, um, and it actually is just one pool. Uh, we had designed it with one singular uh, glazed roof, uh, potentially an operable roof, uh, but below grade, it is one room, one pool. And in conversations, one of the many conversations with uh, both Chicago Landmarks and the Wicker, Wicker Park Committee, and specifically, in keeping with the uh, Secretary of Interior standards of preserving historic and, and significant features, um, we discussed that entry on the south side of the building to Schiller. So there's a, a main entry going west towards Hoyne, and there's this secondary entry uh, heading south towards Schiller that you can see in that top left picture labeled south entry. And preserving that entry as a historic significant feature uh, uh, led us to the solution where we would separate the skylight. So it's one continuous pool below, but it's the skylight above uh, to the sky that is in two, uh, in the two blue rectangles, one larger skylight to the west and one smaller skylight to the east. That was done to preserve that walkway from Schiller to that south entry. Does that answer your question? Uh, I can't hear you. You're on mute. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I said it does. What what is the dimension with the walkway and the lawn on both sides? What what is that dimension between the two openings of of the skylights of the pool? Um, I you know I don't have the exact measurement, but the the walkway is you know five feet wide, and yeah. then there's at least there's at least six feet on either side. So okay. that makes it. I'm just being I'm just being told that it's 18 feet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm wow. That is that's scary. I you know as a as a as a um as a non Olympic swimmer, that's a little scary <laughs> to have to swim 18 feet underground to get to to get up to the other side. I don't no, no, know. No, wait. Maybe I'm overthinking this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The pool is fully below grade. The pool, if you look in the lower right hand drawing, or if you look in the top right hand drawing. Oh, it's just glass that you'll it's see glass. from the, the lawn. Pool, okay. That's right. The pool is a room that is uh that is a room okay. that is below grade, submerged, you know, 12 feet below grade. And the only those blue rectangles are only the glass skylight okay. for the sky. Yeah. So there's okay. no swimming underwater for 18 feet. You and me both. Like I, I couldn't make it. I think okay. I think our client who <laughs> is also not an Olympic swimmer, but but probably could make it to 18 feet, but no, it's just, it's one continuous pool in a room below grade. And those are just skylights that are being separated to allow for that historic pathway to pass through. Okay. Okay. That's clear now. Sorry about that. No, sorry. All right. Thank you. And I just, I think I'll just make a couple points. Um, so clearly there's a lot of, a lot of work that has been done here. Um, and, um, a lot of good work too. I think, um, you know, what, you know, what you've done with the, the relationship with the coach house and like the pool access area and how you sunk everything. It's, it's really thoughtful. And, um, the pool, obviously it's a, it's an incredible structural feat. <laughs> um, and, um, something that I think we'd all love to, to see how that's done. It's, in, it's incredible. Um, I think, um, so, you know, and the presentation is, is really Great. Um, you, you've shown everything that you could possibly want to see uh, here in, in understanding what you're proposing. Um, I think that we need to look at right now as a commission, I think we need to look at the, the front elevation. I think, Larry, you had a one image where you had kind of the two um, sort of the existing condition and um, the proposed um, side by side side by side. And because what we're really talking about, it sounds like we're all in agreement or if, I don't know if we are in agreement, but the contention is the addition and on the north side and really understanding, you know, does you know, the existing condition on the left with the proposed on the right, does that alter sort of the, the character of the building? And, it, you, know, it, you know, in terms of the scale of it. And I think that's what um, staff is, can, is, is, is um, saying it doesn't right now. And so that's what we really need to understand what the commission uh, feels, um, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm going to chime in on this as well, yeah. if I may. Um, I, this is tough because um, I definitely understand the staff's points, um, but I do feel like the due diligence has been done um, to, to make sure that existing facade is close to being unscathed. You know, if this was stripped away in the future, we would still have um, an existing historic facade um, that can return back to its original glory. Uh, the same with the, the, the way that they've offset that, um, that porch over or covered, co I don't know what it is, a walkway to connect the coach house and the main. I think it's a lot of detail has been put into, to, into preserving the existing um, structure and it's commendable. Um, and so uh, I, I, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more from Larry and the team as to what, help, help us explain what the contention is and, and what the, also what are, what's the problem if, if we approve? Can we talk about that a little bit? So, um, you know, obviously we've, we've looked at this quite extensively and, and there have been some, some modifications over time, uh, but staff still remains extremely concerned about the appearance that this presents 
uh, and how it impacts the historic character of that building and its relationship to the site and its relationship to the overall district. Um, like I said in my presentation, uh, the commission really discourages additions to the sides of historic buildings and only really will approve them under certain circumstances. Uh, we feel that this is not one of those and that's why we recommend it as we did. Uh, we did not do it lightly, uh, but we understood that this is what the applicant wanted. Uh, and so, um, you know, we needed to analyze it as presented. So I, you know, I don't have a, a huge amount more to say about it. We kind of made our, our best case for the overall character of the property. And I hope clarified how we believe this impacts it. Um, I do want to encourage the commissioners to kind of look at this project with an eye towards future projects, uh, which may look at this as a precedent for side additions on historic buildings, which may in fact have a, have a greater impact on, on how reviews are done uh, in the future. Um, that being said, I mean, if, if you have specific questions about it, I agree that the applicants did a phenomenal job presenting it and providing enough exhibits so that it could be clearly explained and discussed. And, you know, honestly, that's all we want to happen here today. Thank you, Larry. And I think, I think that's, that's a big concern about precedence. You know, normally, um, often we're always pushing for additions to be, you know, further back. Um, or you know, as, as as obscure as possible, and this certainly um, can't can't say that it does that. So it's something that we need to consider um, on voting on this one. Was Diana uh, trying to say something at one point? Um, I think Larry summarized it very well. I just wanted to add that you know we do understand the depth issue for that rear section behind the existing stair enclosure. Um, you know. Maybe the committee can consider how to deal with that particular issue. Um, but our main focus has been with that form in the front um, that is more um, impactful on the, on the overall scale of the structure as you see it relative to the front facade and the front entry to the home. Thank you. Um... May I say a few words? Who is this? Uh, this is uh, the attorney for the applicant, Mariah DeGrino. Um, I just respond sure. to some of the points sure. that were made. Thank you. Uh, I think you know this this viewpoint here that we're looking at on screen um, is telling in in many ways. Um, you know, but I would suggest this is not really the char the character defining view of this property. And I understand the concern about precedent, um, but you know this is a unique property, even, even among historic properties like this, um, with its unique situation on Hoyne and Schiller, as well as the alley. Um, and even just looking at the viewpoint of the existing building and its existing condition, it's, you know, this, this elevation is clearly differentiated um, through lack of ornamentation, lack of windows, the common brick, the, you know, all of those types of characteristics. And in many ways, this elevation in particular acts almost as though as a, as a rear elevation to the building. You know, the character defining view of this building is really the view around the corner from the corner of Schiller and Hoyne where you see both of those facades of, with the red brick um, together in the context of the coach house. You've got the, the extremely long frontage on Schiller um, that is, you know, really, really gives that, that is the prominent um, viewpoint of the property. So, you know, we've talked a little bit, I've heard a little bit of discussion about obscurity, obscuring things or visibility, but, you know, the visibility of a modification to a historic building is, is not really the standard, you know, changes are going to be visible. This, the changes that have been made are visible here. Um, it, so, you know, what, but what would be visible is located on an elevation of, of much lesser significance it's already been substantially modified. It's been limited in height, so it does not engage with what does remain of historic material on that elevation, the brick and the, the roof line. Um, it uses the common brick color to blend in with the, you know, the lesser significant elevation so it doesn't sort of pop against that, that red brick. And it's also set back from the east and the west to set it apart. 
Um, you know, as, as Andy mentioned, the 2009 edition, um, somewhat inappropriately, engages that roof line and mimics it. And if anything, you know, this, these additions kind of by flanking that um, obscure that inappropriate addition and thereby refocus attention properly on the portions of the house that are significant. Um, so just wanted to offer that. Thank you. Um, Deanna? Are you on mute? I'm on mute. <laughs> I apologize. So, you know, the one thing that has not been brought up, I think maybe is the, what is, uh, what are the uh, significant features uh, that are identified in this designation ordinance? So I can just kind of refresh on that. And I believe that um, these are all exteriors and roof lines, including landscapes and streetscapes for this district. And as you know, from previous projects we've reviewed, uh, landscapes, are not something that we have great guidance on regarding specific planting. So the commission has not really um, reviewed those. Um, but in many projects in this, in this district specifically, we have had um, you know, a lot of consideration about what are the side yards and where the side yards are truly side yards to historic buildings versus where are the individual buildable lots. And we recently had a project that was an infill on a, on a, on a lot that was um, an independent uh, parcel that was built on or proposed to be built on. And there was a lot of discussion back and forth with the community on considering what are these side yards that are historically significant because they were originally part of a larger parcel that was intended to be um, open space. And in, in our view from staff perspective, this is really a poster child for that type of property. It is a large mansion on a large lot that was historically a large lot, it was not multiple pins that were, you know, divided, subdivided, or, you know, added to and then deleted from the property. So from our perspective, when it has an impact on the primary elevation of the building, as we consider main entrance, the primary elevation, that is where our concern is um, regarding its overall impact on the on the scale and shape and and the relationship of the building to the site, and that goes back directly to the commission's guidelines. Um, and as far as the precedent, if the committee were to decide that this is appropriate, um, you know, we we would we would we would appreciate some understanding of how different would this be from any other property that would come and want to have additions to the side yard, because at, at that point, we would need to be able to distinguish and why one is um, treated in a way uh, specific and potentially has some specific circumstances that made that decision possible. Can, can I? Thank you, you Deanna. Yeah, I think um, just uh, I a couple of follow-up uh, points for commission um, to think about. I mean, uh, you know, the vantage point, I mean, this is the front elevation of the building um, and it is a side yard. So, you know, it's, it is, it is kind of a concern to, to approve, you know, a, a, you know, a full extension to a side yard so close to the front of a, of a primary elevation. I think we have to consider that. Um, and yeah, that's my, that's my point to the commission. Can we, Can uh, go ahead, Commissioner Hughes. Sorry, I, I, can we see the other view um, that shows um, the north side? I think in, it was a perspective of the north side. Yeah, this, this here. Um, if, if there was a, I think we're all in agreement about, actually, I don't wanna speak for anyone. Um, I would say understanding the staff, the, the, uh, the staff's perspective, I'm in agreement with, it looks like in this, this bottom right uh, section, number five, um, seems like the, the biggest area of contention, but the, 
the addition that's um, to the east of um, number five. I know it sticks out a bit from that 2009 edition, um, but it doesn't, can, can you clarify Andy, how far it sticks out from the, from the stair edition? It's just another, it's just another few feet. Okay, so. And I just also want to, I just also want to point out that it's, it's, it's aligning with a side yard addition that was approved. So in terms of making or setting precedents about side yard additions, they're, they're, they're reviewed on a, on a case by case basis. And when this came to the PRC in 2009, a side yard addition was approved. It's there. The garage is technically a side yard addition that, that we're, we're just following that line, line up. And I mean, there's no debate that there's more mass or building mass on the site, but but if you're going to add to this building and choose to add way, way less, half as much square footage uh, and burying even half of that, like where else does this square footage go but on the side yard uh, addition that's already been approved by the, by the Landmarks Commission, staying back to that line and staying down below of the historically significant features. I'm curious what the staff has to say about that. You know, if there was a side addition. Hi, this is Larry. Um, so what, what the commission approved in 2008 uh, was really a one story side addition and then a narrower stair enclosure. And that stair enclosure was, was actually pushed back further uh, because the, the commission was reluctant to approve any encroachments into that side yard that weren't strictly necessary. I mean, to say that to say that you're building on a one-story addition and you're putting two stories on top of that and that it's the same as the one story, I, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's accurate. Any other debate for commission? Yeah, I would like to hear the staff's thoughts on the the side addition that's behind the the stair enclosure. I know it sticks out further, but it is set sort of to the rear of the property. What's the staff's thoughts on that? Well, we really we really find that having that corner project out beyond that enclosure really draws attention to that. Uh, and that's why we recommended that it be narrowed somewhat. I believe it's three and a half feet. Um, you know, it's up to the commissioners to decide if, if that's of concern or not, but our recommendation is that it is. Uh, Deanna? Deanna? Here. Sorry, I just wanted to add to that, you know, as, as I previously said, um, and I think Larry is not in disagreement with that, is the primary focus that we had was the form labeled number five. And yes, we were concerned with that projection, which I understand might be about three and a half feet. Um, but if you were to ask which is more important in, in the impact or more um, visible and more uh, has a more of an adverse impact on the overall scale of the building, we would say number five. Thank, Thank you. you, that's very helpful. Um, can I see uh, number three to the west? Can I see what the back of the house looks like? Number three to the west, I don't know if I'm being clear. And I'm sorry, number three, yes looking west. Can we see what the back of the property looks like? This here. Okay, so this is more common brick and more, okay. Um, Commissioner, I'm sorry to interrupt, just to let you know that that, that um, existing rear elevation that you see that I think is numbered number two, that is also a previously approved addition. It is not part of the historic structure. I see, okay. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> are you asking for a recommendation now? <laughs> so, so um, uh, I, we can, you know, we can um, review the, let's look at the, the rec I mean, we could make a modification or we could approve the staff recommendation or we could not, you know, but we could vote on the staff recommendation or make a modification to it. If we don't agree um, that, you know, these additions um, would have an adverse effect on the landmark. Mm -hmm. um, or if we think one of the additions is okay, and the, maybe the, the forward facing the forward edition is not okay, and that's something that you know we can modify the recommendation. Chair Sikowitz, could I uh, add one thing? What, one of the other attorneys for the sure. applicant, I, I, Paul Shadel with DLA Piper. I just you know I'm listening to the conversation. Clearly, I'm here to represent Mr. Wilson, but I you know clearly reasonable minds differ on the aesthetics. That's clear. There are a bunch of reasonable people here talking about very fine points. I think. I just want to emphasize two points. Um, the landmarks ordinance is intended to protect these buildings as it should. I think uh, Andy described care pretty in a very detailed way how they have sought to balance the protection and really have, have protected the architecturally significant features while also trying to accommodate the need of the family to have a certain quantity of floor area and different kinds of living space for, for the family. So I wanted to point that out that I think that the, the effort here was to do that in the least uh, the least obtrusive way possible. And so any other location of this massing, and again, I think Andy explained this better than I can from a design standpoint, but any other location of the massing or the floor area that they're seeking to include, which again is substantially less than, than the city code would allow, the floor area would create more of an obstruction. And then I would just point since there is a set of standards, I would point everyone to standard nine, which I think is the one that addresses most directly the issue that you all are debating. And it says that new additions, exterior alterations or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. And I think I would just posit based on what Andy said that this addition, even though it does, it is visible. And as, as Mariah pointed out, visibility in and of itself is not uh, counter to the purposes of the, of the historic, of the landmarks ordinance. It hits every single point in that standard. Uh, the, that is the, 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 it doesn't destroy any historic materials. In fact, it, it, it will, as Andy pointed out, it's below the roof line and the other historic materials. Uh, it's very much differentiated. And I think that's maybe what's causing some of the concern is that it actually satisfies that standard by differentiating it from the old. And it's compatible in every way with the massing, size, scale, and again, the architectural features. And I, I'm a lawyer, so I apologize. I get into parsing language, but, but um, I think that language is very important. And it's important to note that the design responds directly to that standard. And I just uh, would respectfully ask that you take that into consideration. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chadle. Um. Thank you. And, you know, it's the concern is, is the precedent, right, that it's setting forth for future projects. Um, the solution is um, not being disputed or anything like that, or it's just setting the precedent of future projects. And so normally we see com other projects that have similar types of of challenges to meet and how they resolve them. It, Steph, am I correct that this would be like the first of its kind, a unique situation? And is that, you is know, that <laughs> going to go prominent it, or I, So it, it, we, are, we are being consistent in how we are treating the side addition uh, I don't know if this is the first proposal that, that this commission has seen that is comparable. I mean, to the, you know, there may there may have been others maybe before my time, but I, I think I think that we, you know, we have some we have some concerns not only about this particular project, but about how it may impact our overall uh, our overall ability to review side additions in similar cases in districts throughout the city. Commissioner, if I might add to that, 
Um, you may recall that in some cases, when we are dealing with a street wall of smaller uh, lot sizes, for example, where you have, we've had some cases where additions to the buildings were designed to look like um, an independent structure within a street wall where you had, a, a, that particular addition was of a scale of a comparable infill structure. It had an, a specific design to the front facade with the setbacks, the materials and such that fit within uh, the whole district as a uh, almost like an independent structure that would, uh, to a pedestrian perspective, look exactly like a new separate building. So we've had that type of discussion. And I think the one most recently was in this district on a, a vacant lot that was an independent parcel. Um, um, but in this case, we're talking about a building that um, is not in that type of streetscape where we could make that argument. Yes. May I respond? Um, please try to be really brief if you can. Of course. Um, if I could ask that the view on screen um, be uh, adjusted to show through the rendering from the southeast or southwest corner. Um, when you think about the, you know, the, this is this setting precedent, I just want to respond on the precedent point again. I, I would be hard pressed to find a site that would um, be comparable to this one, given its location on the corner, the large amount of, of yard space along Schiller and Hoyne. And, you know, if the if we were to take staff's suggestion and, and relocate volume to the rear of the house where they would put it, um, you know, that's that's putting it between the coach house and the primary building, the primary residence. And from, from the Schiller vantage point, it would actually, you know, disrupt the relationship between the primary house and the coach house and obscure the separation of those two buildings. So. I, I don't think that, uh, I, again, being <laughs> here on, on behalf of the applicant, I have a little bit of a bias, but um, I'm, I don't believe this would be precedent setting in the way that um, staff has articulated would be of concern to them because th this really is unlike most, if not all of the, the, the houses um, in the district like this, given its prominence, its location, its um, configuration with the alley, as well as two frontages, um, extensive frontages on, on Schiller and the extensive yard um, along Schiller as well. All right, thank you. Just, just um, super quickly, we're, we're looking at a picture technically of the side yard of this house. The, the canonical view of this house is this side yard, not the front. The, the image used to introduce this project is not the image, is not the view of this house that that we're worried about the precedent being set on. Um, this is the view of this house. This is the canonical view that everybody in Wicker Park thinks about when they think of this house. And it's the side yard and it's completely unaffected. And with the addition of the pool, it's forever unaffected. And just this small amount of square footage is added to the north. Uh, it's just absolutely from an expert's opinion, the only place that this can be added in a sensitive way. And it kind of just locks the whole house in, in perpetuity. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we're ready to make a decision. Okay. Um, well, but yeah. Um, does anyone have a, a motion or should we put the staff, uh, the motion as it is? But I'll just put the motion out there. Um, uh, like to reco to, Request a motion uh, to adopt the staff recommendation for the project. Do I have a motion? Can I, I need clarity on this recommendation. When they say the corner, are they talking about the both of those additions on either sides of the stair enclosure or just the one um, that's near this front facade of the house? It's talking about both of them being modified from the previous design. Larry, please clarify if you'd like. So the recommendation is basically uh, elimination of the proposed two-story addition 
on the west side of the stair enclosure and narrowing of the enclosure on the east side of the stair addition. Uh, and this, this slide was sort of uh, intended to, to uh, indicate the, the eliminations just outlined in red. And that's, uh, that's the extent of, of that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's clear. Um, do you... What about... Uh, I'm gonna propose a modification to the staff recommendations. Um, I agree with the elimination of number five. Um, but the the addition the addition to the oh my god guys the addition to the northeast east, east. yes can uh, remain the same size um, and I'm you know I don't want to force the designer's hand but it looks like that back elevation which is our east elevation of the house would be where that number five addition would have to go. Um, so my modification to the staff recommendations, accept everything as is with the exception of number three being able to remain full size or sorry, the Southeast, the Northeast um, two-story addition being able to stay the same size. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Um, so is that is that clear in terms of how we were proposing to modify the And uh, to Deanna's point about why, uh, explaining why we would approve that size as is, um, has to do with the viability of space of the room. Um, and I think Andy made it very clear in his presentation that losing that those three square feet will make the room inviable for the uses that they need. So that is why we would approve that extension beyond the stair enclosure that's there. Okay. So um, Commissioner Hughes has made a motion um, to modify the staff recommendation to eliminate um, the proposed addition uh, number five, but allow for the rear addition to stay as uh, proposed as well as the remainder of the project. Do we have a second? Yes, I second. Great, thank you, Commissioner Ponce seconds. And I, um, we'll also agree with that motion. And so um, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is a, you know, thank you for your stewardship. This is really a great project. And, um, you know, we, we look forward to, to seeing it, um, you know, develop. Um, and, you know, there's uh, some incredible structural work that needs to be done. So good luck. Can I request a point of clarification on process? Sure. Um, I understand that the pre-permit review process does involve the opportunity for um, referring the matter to the full commission as well as an informal conference. And I would um, request staff to maybe enlighten me at least on what the appropriate next steps are in this uh, process. Um, just wanna make sure that I'm clear. I believe that this was a pre-permit project. Is that accurate, Larry? That's right. So uh, basically, this would be a conditional approval by the Permit Review Committee at the time that a permit application is received by our office. We would, we would basically review the plans for compliance with the conditions that were given um, and approved by the Permit Review Committee. Um, the informal conference really is a process that is set up when there is an actual denial of a permit application. And then it sets certain processes of a public hearing and um, uh, informal conference and, the, and final decisions by the Landmarks Commission. I guess from our perspective, Deanna, this is effectively a denial. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a pre-permit approval of a project with conditions. Um, the denial is really only done at the point that there is an actual permit application. If, if the project cannot be approved by staff as 
as um, agreed to and, and uh, approved conditionally by the Permanent Review Committee. I think our concern is just that we know the project can't proceed with this with this design. So we we and we want to work with you. Our client wants to work with you. In fact, he was trying to speak. He had some trouble. I don't know if it's um, what the issue is, but he can't seem to get his mic to work. Um, I, I think our concern is again the project. This would effectively leave that property with a single story garage sort of sitting out in front all by itself. Um, which again, I'm not an architect. Andy could speak to the aesthetic result of that and how that does or doesn't comply with the standards, but we're, um, the reason we wanted to talk about having the informal conference is to discuss maybe with staff in some more detail, an alternative to just lopping off those two stories because that we understand from our client right now that that we're, again, he can't speak. Um, um, apparently I his mic is working, but he can't unmute. But in any case, it's not a, it's not a proposal that he can proceed with. So I just, we just so, wanted to let. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no, that's okay. I'm you sorry. know, we, we are happy at staff level to discuss any alternatives to projects at any point that you wish to have um, changes to the design. And at that point, it's either, you know, we are at a point that we can come back to the committee with a revised design that we can recommend or not. Regardless, you have the ability to come back to the committee with new plans at any point in time um, for their consideration. This is just the decision purely on the plans in front of them now. Fair enough. So that you, we do not need to go into an informal conference process to do that. That, that answers the procedural question. Thank you, Deanna. Yes. All right. Thank you, Deanna. So I believe that, um, that we can, that, that concludes that item and that there will be work beyond this to potentially resubmit uh, a, a proposal or work with staff to, uh, to modify the proposal. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, there's no further business, business uh, today. So I'd like to make a motion uh, to adjourn. Do we have a second? I'll move. The oh, second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries unanimously. Um, and that concludes our meeting. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank all right, you. have a good one.